scientist. <laughs> That's a yeah, good And he's going to talk about optogenetics. So, yeah. Uh, what is the presentation? So, okay. So, you can hear me well, right? So, yeah. So, thanks for the lecture, Evgeny. Yeah. This is what I need. Everything works. So, hi, everybody. So, my name is Evgeny, as you heard already. I'm your scientist from uh, Market Street, from the Bite Center from LMU there. And uh, today I'm going to talk about optogenetics. So pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting topic. So for many neuroscientists, and I think that uh, I hope that by the end of my talk you will kind of share the feeling as well. So let me start my talk with a, a bit in a weird way. So I want to tell you first what optogenetics is not. So optogenetics is not optical genetics. First of all, because it's not. Second, because there is no such thing as optical genetics at all. So, just to avoid any confusion from the very first slide. And before we come to optogenetics, so let's jump back to the past, to 1997. So, those of you who are approximately of my age might remember this movie. So, and maybe you also remember who were these two guys and what they did with this small device here in their hands. So, this device is just a bright flashlight. What they did with it, they tried to erase memory of other people so that they don't remember at all that they have ever met these two guys. Yeah, because they were secret agents, logically. So, pretty brilliant idea for that kind of movie, science fiction movie in 1997. Now we have 2017, right? So, and I think you wonder how much we have advanced since that time over the last 20 years in this technique. Can we control brain with light? And I'm happy to say that we do, we can control. So, since 2005 at least, Unfortunately, I have to admit, we can control that only in animals so far. And also, with this nice idea with this flashlight also didn't work well, so that we have to deliver light directly to the brain using optical fibers, so implanting on the animal head. So and here we come to the point, so what is optogenetics? Optogenetics. So we can say that it's a way to control brain with light, but given that the goal of science in general is not to control brain of mice, so therefore, I would rephrase it in a way, optogenetics is a tool to study brain, to study the brain using light and some genetic engineering. So, before, we, before I explain you what the, how it works, so uh, let's watch two videos which will demonstrate you how much we can influence animal behavior just by flashing light on particular areas in the brain. So in the first video, you will see a mouse here, optical fibers implanted, we deliver light by these optical fibers to a particular brain region which is controlling uh, aggression and hunting behavior in the mouse, in mice. So mouse will run in this transparent plastic cage and beside the mouse there will be this uh, object here, just wooden stick, so which is unfamiliar to the animal. Animal has never experienced that. So what happens usually, animals just try to find out what is this, they just run around check, smell, touch uh, his paws, touch his whiskers, so to kind of check how dangerous the object is. And then in this uh, corner here, which is, you'll see the status of the light source that we use, in this case the laser is either on or off. So let's see what happens when we switch the light on. So, okay, exploration, it's kind of slowed down, the speed is slower than it should be, of course. Just a piece of this free exploration now. So let's see what happens. The cell goes on, and animal suddenly changes the behavior and starts to attack the object, uh, trying to bite it, trying to destroy it. It's a totally unusual behavior in this case, so they never do this, at least before they learn the object. Okay, that's one example. Let's go to the second one. Again, we have similar situation animal in the cage, so optical fiber illuminating different brain region, which is responsible for feeling thirsty or for drinking behavior. And this metal uh, tube here is just tip of the bottle, so this water. And the main point here is that animal has absolutely free access to water all the time, so there is no any restriction this time. So, let's see. Again, just free exploration, running around, smelling around. Everything is usual. Now light is on. 
And immediately after that, animals start drinking, and it keeps drinking and drinking and drinking while the light is on, and just stops when the light goes off. And if you repeat it multiple times, the animals will just drink multiple times. So, so as long as the uh, light is on. So um, I hope that kind of these two videos made you a bit curious. So how this technique works in jail. Of course, if you just pick a random animal and light and illuminate it with a light, I don't know, from your table lamp, it will not work. So you kind of have to do a few manipulations with the animal and use special lights. So we will talk about this. But before we talk about that, so let me give you a few, uh, just remind you a few things about brain functions so you can understand what I am talking about. So brain is a very complex structure that we all know. So brain consists of multiple regions. Each region has its own function. And each region also in turn can take, consists of multiple neurons of different types. There are multiple types of neurons, they different they shape, activity level, composition, and so on, so on, so on. Um, these neurons are interconnected with each other and constantly interact with each other. One of the main features which differ neurons from other cells in the body is that they can generate electrical pulses which spread along their bodies from one end to another end. So it means that when I say that the neuron is active or a neuron is activated by something, so I mean that the neuron generates an electrical pulse. Either a single pulse or a series of pulses doesn't matter. And if we have few neurons connected to each other, when such a pulse reaches the end, it can activate the next neuron, that neuron activates the next neuron, the next neighbor, and so on and so on. And we can say that neurons can interact with each other by means of these electrical <coughs> pulses. So, which means that when we say that we can control brain, we mean just that we can control neurons in the brain. And controlling neurons just means that we can force them to generate these electrical pulses when we need that, independent from their uh, spontaneous activity and any processes which uh, happens within the neurons. So that we can know now so what I mean when I say that we can control neurons. Good, so now let's come, uh, let's come to the optogenetics. So let's start from the beginning, when we, how it has been invented. As usual, this high-tech idea came or was adopted from nature, namely from pretty uh, simple species called green algae, chlamydia monas, like you can see there. This algae, algae, algae you can, algae you can find basically in any pool outside, especially when the pool is not cleaned properly. So it's just single cell organism. They live uh, usually close to the water surface because they need light for photosynthesis. The interesting thing about this organism is that it has special light sensitive organ inside, so which helps them to orient towards light and move towards light. This organ, like the core element of this organ, is light sensitive protein called channel rhodopsin. At this point, let me just give you like small comment, like small side comment. So this, just for the next slide, we don't need that. So this protein is present in this organ, organism, just because this organism has a special gene which encodes this protein. So it means that the organism can produce the protein on its own using this gene. So just keep it in mind, you will need it next slide. Let's come back to the chelidotopsin. Chelidotopsin is a light sensitive protein. It means that it responds to blue light by letting positively charged ions to go, go through the membrane into the cell. You can think about it just as a about simple channel or just gate, uh, which is closed under normal conditions without light, so that no positive ions can go through. When you shine light, it opens and the positive ions go into the cell. And that's exactly what neurons need to generate electrical pulses. When many positive ions go through the membrane to neurons, they generate pulses. So therefore, no wonder that scientists came up with a fresh idea. They said, OK, so neurons usually have no chelidopsin, they're not sensitive to light. What happens if we take chelidopsin and insert artificially them to neurons? Question is, can you make neurons sensitive, responsive to light by inserting this protein to them? So we can illustrate it by this diagram here. So we have chelidopsin, we insert it to some neurons, let's say to selected neurons, because we don't want to activate the whole brain, we just want to activate a specific group. Then we shine light. What happens then, so in neurons which have chelidopsin, this channel gets open. Positive ions go into neurons, and neurons generate electrical pulses. Or 
<laughs> That's my input. <laughs> so either they start generating passwords or they just generate more passwords than they would have done so under normal conditions, right? Or then compared to other neurons which do not have children that soon. So the idea has worked out in 2005. Toward this goal, scientists had to basically solve two technical problems. Problem one, how to insert channel of to neurons. Problem two, how to deliver light to neurons. Let's just go one by one. So first problem, how to insert. Here we need technique which is described by the second half of the name of genetics. We need some genetic engineering. So what can we do here? So we take green area, area extract a gene of channel of sin. So here I just want to stress that we don't take the protein itself, we take the gene which encodes that protein. Because the only way to insert this protein to neuron in a way that it stays there long enough, like a few months at least. So it's inserting the gene instead of the protein. So to make neuron making, producing this protein on its own. Right? So we insert gene. How to insert gene to neurons? We use widely used technique here, which is now very popular in science. We use virus as a transporter. We insert gene to that virus, and we inject virus to the animal brain to a specific area which we want to activate later. So what happens then? So these viral particles attach to neurons, inject genes to that neurons, and these neurons start producing channel of seed on its own. So it looks like you can see here, so some neurons, infected neurons, have channel of seed and they become light sensitive. The last question that we have to fix now is how to make it neuron specific, so, so that not all, all neurons uh, express channel of seed. So, I have no time to go into details here. Please just believe me, there are techniques in genetics, so let's call them uh, genetic tricks. So, using these genetic tricks, we can insert channel of seed to particular neurons only. So, next question, the next problem that has to be solved is how to deliver light. And here we deal with the first part of the name of genetics, optics. Right. So, of course, we need light source. And uh, channel opsin is sensitive only to blue light. So it means that we need uh, a light of particular wavelengths, blue distance. So therefore, we use inhalators or powerful light emitting diodes, so LEDs. And to deliver the light from the source to the brain, we just use classical optical fibers. Nothing special here, but like you see, uh, sorry, like you see here. And because the skull of the animal is not transparent for light, unfortunately we have to do surgery, we have to make a small opening in the skull, like you see here, that's the skull, and here's a small opening, and we have to insert the uh, optical fiber to the brain, and then we fix everything in the brain. In practice, of course, we don't insert directly the optical fiber, but rather we insert the uh, implant special adapter so that we can plug it and plug the fiber. So when we don't do experiment with animals, we don't, we don't connect. And then eventually what we get, we get the animal, which is a genetically modified animal. So some neurons of this animal in particular area express channel of seen, and they become sensitive to light. And we have a way to deliver light to those neurons. Let's see what happens within the brain of this guy. So again, so we have uh, neurons. Some of them have channel of seen. They're sensitive. Under normal conditions, and we don't illuminate with light. So they have just normal activity. As soon as we switch light on, here there must be light, so I don't know why I don't see it, but anyway, we have light here. So those neurons become active and generate the electrical pulses, right? And the main point here is that uh, only those neurons are activated, while all other neurons, which have no transepsin, just stay not affected at all. So they just stay at the same uh, activity level as before. And that's basically how the genetics works, because now, as soon as you have a subset of neurons that you can control with light, you can test your hypothesis, you can test whether they're important for that function or for that function, you can activate them, and also we can also suppress them. I don't mention here, but there is a way to suppress them. So, coming to the end, let's uh, briefly overview kind of what kind of applications we can do with this uh, technique. First of all, let's talk about science, because in science, optogenetics is applied since 2005. Uh, the main breakthrough that optogenetics brought to the science is that we can control brain activity at the level of individual neurons or small uh, 
group of neurons. And that allowed scientists to identify small brain circuits, small brain, like small neuron groups, which are responsible for controlling particular physiological functions. So I can illustrate it with this picture here. So let's say that our initial stop, starting point, we could say that, that this brain region, this huge cortical, cortical region here, is responsible, let's say, for just arbitrary decision making. And that brain region was critical for memory. And what we have now is more or less like this. So we go into details, we increase the resolution, and we can already identify very small uh, circuits within the brain which controls different functions. And also it looks like, if you want to imagine that, think about images of the Earth's uh, surface done by satellites, let's say 40 years ago, when we could see only big cities on the images, and now you can identify individual persons on the street. So that kind of gives you an estimate of the change that we have now with the optogenetics. Good. So the second um, research direction which really benefited from optogenetics is the discovery of new treatments for neurological disorders using animal models. What I mean here is the following. If you take animals and genetically modify them to simulate a particular human disorder, and you say no which neurons are responsible or which neurons do not work properly and that's the reason for a particular symptom of that development disease, you can restore the function, activate these neurons using optogenetic technique and kind of cure that particular symptom of this disease. And that can be translated very later to the human medicine because now the genetic is not used in human medicine. medicine. Uh, but to give an idea of how it could look potentially, let's consider this example. Let's say we have a patient with some disease and let's assume that we know that this disease is related to the malfunctioning of the neurons somewhere right here. So, the modern approach, if drugs do not help anymore, is to restore the function of neurons by electrical stimulation. So we implant the metal electrode to that region, we pass the electrical current, and try to activate neurons uh, by means of this electrical current. It's called so-called deep brain stimulation. So the main disadvantage of this approach is that it's absolutely not uh, selective with respect to neurons. It activates those neurons which are malfunctioning, and also those neurons which have nothing to do with that symptoms and which that, with that disorder. So it, it can cause a lot of uh, different uh, side effects very unpleasant for the person. So what can we change with the genetics? Let's say we have a way to uh, inject the virus safely to the brain and uh, insert channels of seeing to those specific neurons, then we can apply light to restore the function. And in this way, it's going to be much more selective than just with electrical stimulation. But again, just to make it clear, it's like our future, hopefully. So at the moment, it's not applied. Good. So now, so I hope I convince you that this technique is pretty cool. And it's relatively simple, at the same time, it's extremely powerful. Therefore, it has spread very fast since 2005. And at the moment, thousands of labs use it in their research. And if you try to Google it, so like one of the most popular words that you will find would look like technological breakthrough or revolution in neuroscience and so on. So, and basically we can say now that some dreams from that science fiction movie in 1997 so indeed come true. Thanks a lot. For questions? Someone would like to ask a question? Yes. So, <laughs> ethical problems and practical also. So, practical problem is that uh, you need much uh, stricter control how the gene which you transport with the virus gets inserted to the genome of the, uh, of the person, right? Because now in animals, basically, it can get inserted to more or less random play. Main point for us is that it works, expression happens, right? We see, the, we get the child of soon. But what can get, what we can get in humans, for example, that some normal genes stop working properly, or we get this cancer effect that you know proliferation will not be controlled anymore. So it means that we need to develop new virus and new technique which will be like under full control if it comes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the main problem with this. Some other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what you basically do is you take um, Are there other approaches to achieve the same thing, like with electrodes or something? Absolutely.
quite good. So since already a long time, people use uh, either like electrical currents through the, passing through the metal electrodes, or you can also inject some chemical substance which will activate neurons as well. But both of them are non-specific relative to neurons, right? Because it affects the whole tissue which you inject. And also the volume that you affect is not well controlled, right? Because you can just uh, use like trial and error approach to determine how much you have to inject or how much current you need to inject to stimulate so much, mm -hmm. right? But in any case, within this volume that you can kind of adjust, you stimulate all the neurons, right? So it means that you can't really uh, assess, let's say, what is the function of that particular subgroup within this volume for, I don't know, drinking behavior, right? Because within this volume, there are a lot of different types of neurons. And also axons, part of other neurons, you activate everything. Okay, yeah. can you really choose which area, or do you always have to drill again in your cell? Or do you do it one time, and then you can choose any area you want somehow? With the yeah, so basically, you have, of course, to, to plan where you make this opening, right, to reach particular brain region. Of course, you reach, like, multiple on the way, mm -hmm. right? But you cannot really go from here to there. Yeah. Right? So you will damage too much tissue. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. Okay. So one question. Unfortunately, we have time only for one question. Yes, you showed very fascinating video about these mice here. Uh, an interesting point would be what happens to these animals if they are sleeping and you sort of stimulate behavior. Do they start dreaming? Uh, Let's say it has not been described in that paper, but uh, as I understand that, they would just start and start, start drinking, right? Because basically, that work, so they really identified particular neurons which control the drinking behavior. So you activate this animal, start doing that. So in this sense, they will not be changed just due to the fact that animal is sleeping. So. so we don't have time, unfortunately. But well, we can just continue during the break, of course. During the break, so you can approach him and ask whatever you like.